The USS Yorktown vaulted to legend status after checking Japanese aggression during the early months of the Pacific War. She was the third ship of the United States Navy to bear the name of the decisive battle of the Revolutionary War and would prove to be a durable and stubborn warship to sink. Yorktown earned three battle stars for her service before being lost during the Battle of Midway, where her aviators played a pivotal role in the victory achieved by U.S. forces. Yorktown, or CV-5 as she was designated, was the lead ship of her class and was designed and built under the limitations imposed by the interwar treaties. The Navy originally intended to build three carriers out of this class and prioritized speed, protection, and aircraft capacity during the design phase. They realized early on in the process that getting three carriers with the requirements that they were seeking, while still staying within treaty limits, was nearly impossible. The Navy decided to build two carriers that would fully meet all of the desired design requirements, instead of three that were lacking in some departments. This decision would lead to the Yorktown class becoming the preeminent pre-war American carrier class that would set the stage for all future designs. The Navy would get a third Yorktown, the Hornet, when the treaty system broke down with the onset of war in the late 1930s. Yorktown and her sisters were fast at 32.5 knots, which would allow them to operate in the forward scouting and striking groups that the Navy envisioned. This concept produced the early war Central Pacific raids that Yorktown and Enterprise made and would evolve into the Fast Carrier Task Force. They were well protected, as evidenced by the stubbornness of both Yorktown and Hornet's sinkings, and the multiple hits that Enterprise survived throughout the war, and they had an air wing of 90-plus planes. The design features that made the Yorktown class special would be rolled into the Essex class that would roam the Pacific and take names from 1943 onward. Yorktown was ordered on August 3, 1933, and was built by the Newport News Shipbuilding Company. In an interesting twist, she was built right next to her sister Enterprise, which usually doesn't happen. She was 824 feet long, and her beam was 83 feet wide at the waterline. Her flight deck was 802 feet long and 109 feet wide. Yorktown had a standard displacement of just under 20,000 tons and a full load displacement of 25,500 tons. She was powered by nine oil-fired Babcock and Wilcox boilers, which fed steam to four geared steam turbines that each drove one propeller shaft. She was rated for 120,000 shaft horsepower and had a top speed of 32.5 knots with a cruising range of 12,500 nautical miles at a speed of 15 knots. Yorktown was protected by an armor belt that was between 2 and 4 inches thick. For air defense, she was equipped with 8 5-inch, 38-caliber guns in single mounts located along the sides of the flight deck. She also had four quadruple mounts of 1.1-inch, 75 caliber guns, and 24 50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns. In December 1941, she would have 24 single mount 20 millimeter Ehrlichon autocannons added to her anti aircraft battery. Yorktown was equipped with a SC surface search radar set and a CXAM air search radar set in 1940. Her skipper at the time, Captain Elliot Buckmaster, reported in March 1941 that the new radar allowed aircraft to be tracked at distances up to 100 miles. He recommended that the Navy equip its aircraft with electronic identification equipment, and this was the birth of IFF, Identification Friend or Foe. He also recommended that aircraft carriers should be equipped with separate and complete facilities on board for tracking and plotting radar contacts. This was the birth of the Combat Information Center, or CIC. Both of these recommendations would become integral parts of flight operations and fleet air defense during the Pacific War. Yorktown was manned by 2,217 officers, enlisted personnel and air crews, by 1941. Her keel was laid on May 21, 1934, and she was launched on April 4, 1936. She would commission into the fleet about a year and a half later, in September 1937. After her fitting-out period, Yorktown set sail for the Caribbean in January 1938 to conduct her shakedown cruise.
Her pre-war service matched that of many other recently commissioned ships. She trained off the U.S. East Coast and participated in the yearly fleet exercises. She was sent to the Pacific in April 1940, and the following spring, she would be sent to reinforce the Atlantic fleet and participate in neutrality patrols. Yorktown would conduct four neutrality patrols before U.S. entry into the war and operated on a wartime footing during this period. She would log over 17,000 miles during her time in the Atlantic. Yorktown put into Norfolk on December 2nd and was there five days later when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. While at Norfolk, she would have her anti-aircraft battery beefed up with the addition of 24 20mm Ehrlichon guns. She got underway for the Pacific in mid-December and reached San Diego on December 30th, where she became flagship of the newly formed Task Force 17. The start of the new year saw Yorktown on escort duty once again as she covered a convoy taking Marine reinforcements to American Samoa. On February 1st, Yorktown's aviators struck Japanese shore installations and shipping at Jaluit. Planes from Yorktown also attacked Japanese installations and ships at Macon and Mili Atolls. These raids were important in that, while Yorktown's pilots inflicted some damage on the enemy, they got their feet wet and gained valuable experience that would help them later on in May and June. Yorktown returned to Pearl Harbor and replenished there before she put to sea again in mid-February. On March 6th, she rendezvoused with USS Lexington's task force and headed to attack Japanese shipping. However, as the two flattops made their way to their operating area, the Japanese landed on the eastern end of New Guinea. This prompted a change in the objective. On the morning of March 10th, both carriers launched an early morning strike, which amounted to more than 100 planes. The launching point was in the Gulf of Papua, which provided security for the task force, while also ensuring the American pilots the element of surprise. Some of Yorktown's planes attacked Japanese ships in the Salamaua area, while others went after auxiliaries moored close to the shore at Ley. Her fighter planes strafed and provided a combat air patrol over the Salamaua Ley area. The raid was somewhat successful but could have been more effective. The biggest takeaway was that the strikes gave her pilots more invaluable experience. Yorktown remained in the area into April, patrolling and ready to carry out offensive operations whenever opportunities presented themselves. After some needed upkeep in late April, Yorktown would be back on the grind, once again in the Coral Sea, and on May 4th, her planes attacked the Japanese landings at Tulagi in the Solomons. Her aviators sank a Japanese destroyer, three mine layers, and four barges, as well as destroying five seaplanes. Then, on May 7th, the Battle of the Coral Sea heated up for the U.S. flattops and Yorktown's aviators, along with Lexington's, found the Japanese light carrier Shoho and punished her unmercifully, sending her to the bottom. In the afternoon, fighters would drive off several Japanese planes attempting to locate the two U.S. carriers. Then things got crazy. As dusk settled over the U.S. task force, three Japanese planes mistook Yorktown for their own carrier and attempted to land on her. The ship's gunners drove them off. Incredibly, 20 minutes later, three more enemy pilots attempted to make the same mistake. Yorktown's gunners would down one and drive the other two away. The battle would heat up again the next day. Scout planes from Lexington finally found the main Japanese fleet, and Yorktown planes scored two bomb hits on the Pearl Harbor veteran Shokaku, damaging her flight deck and preventing her from launching aircraft. But as the American planes were hammering the Japanese carriers, Japanese planes were about to hammer the U.S. flat tops. The Japanese strike arrived shortly before 11 a.m. The combat air patrol tore into the Japanese formations, downing 17 planes, but some still managed to get through to hit Lexington with several torpedoes and bombs. Yorktown was skillfully maneuvered by Captain Buckmaster, and she managed to dodge eight torpedoes. Then, attacked by dive bombers, the ship managed to evade all but one bomb. That one, however, penetrated the flight deck and exploded below decks, killing or seriously injuring 66 men. The explosion also damaged several of her boilers and rendered them inoperable, which would end up having major ramifications later on during the Battle of Midway in June. All told, she would suffer about 12 near misses during the attack, 
and these would cause considerable damage to her hull below the waterline. Yorktown's excellent damage control parties managed to bring the fires under control, and despite her wounds, the ship was still able to continue flight operations. Lexington was not as lucky, and at 1707, the order was given to abandon ship after a massive explosion rocked the carrier. Yorktown returned to Pearl Harbor on May 27th, where it was estimated that it would take two weeks to get her in a seaworthy condition, and three months to repair her battle damage properly. Miraculously, yard workers laboring around the clock made enough repairs to enable the ship to be put to sea again in 72 hours. But they did not have the time to repair the damaged superheaters in several of her boilers. This would limit her top speed greatly and have grave consequences in the waters off midway. Her watertight integrity was also somewhat in question due to the damage sustained below the waterline that was repaired in haste. Her air group was reinforced by planes and pilots from Saratoga, who was on the sidelines due to repairs and a refit. The hour of greatness was upon Yorktown and her men. Ready for battle, she got underway as the flagship of Task Force 17 on May 30th for the next chapter of the Pacific War, the Battle of Midway. Yorktown rendezvoused with Enterprise and Hornet 300 miles northeast of Midway, at a location dubbed Point Luck by Admiral Nimitz. On the morning of June 4th, Yorktown launched scout planes to search for the Japanese, but they found nothing. A PBY Catalina flying boat from Midway, though, sighted two of the approaching Japanese carriers at around 5.30 in the morning. After Yorktown's search group returned, a flight deck ballet took place in which the deck was respotted for the launch of the ship's strike group. Seventeen Dauntlesses, twelve Devastators, and six Wildcats would be sent out in the day's initial strike, which roared down and off her flight deck just after 8.30. Enterprise and Hornet had launched their strike groups just after 7 o'clock, and it was decided by their task force's commanding officer, Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, that the striking aircraft should proceed to the target immediately rather than waste time assembling the strike. He viewed neutralizing the enemy carriers as the key to the survival of his own task force. This meant that the American strike would be somewhat uncoordinated and that the torpedo and dive bombers from these two carriers would not have appropriate fighter cover while over the Japanese fleet. Torpedo planes from Hornet located the Japanese carrier force first and attacked just before 9.30, followed about an hour later by the torpedo squadrons from Enterprise and Yorktown. They would be slaughtered. Of the 41 torpedo planes that attacked the Japanese carriers, only six returned to Enterprise and Yorktown. Not a single one made it back to Hornet. The destruction of the torpedo planes, as tragic as it was, had several unintended benefits. First, the attacks forced the Japanese carriers to maneuver so wildly that they could not launch their own aircraft, and also caused the anti-aircraft fire to not be as concentrated as it would have been if they were in a proper air defense formation. Secondly, the Japanese combat air patrol had departed their high-altitude cover to concentrate on the devastators who were flying low to make their torpedo runs. This left the skies above the Japanese fleet wide open with little opposition for the Dauntlesses arriving from Yorktown and Enterprise a few minutes later. Virtually unopposed, Yorktown's SBDs heeled over and attacked at about 10.25. The results were nothing short of spectacular. Yorktown's dive bombers pummeled Soryu with three 1,000-pound bombs that turned the ship into an inferno. Yorktown's pilots had caught the Japanese carrier in the midst of air operations and with a hangar deck full of armed and fueled strike aircraft. In addition, there was also unstowed ordnance and fuel lines lying everywhere on the hangar deck. This combination of aircraft, bombs, and gasoline proved disastrous to the Japanese that day. At this point, three of the four Japanese carriers had been put out of action by planes from the two Yorktown class carriers. The fourth Japanese carrier, Hiryu, who had been separated from her sisters during their demise, soon launched a strike of 18 dive bombers and 18 fighters at Yorktown. The inbound strike was detected at 11.59 by Yorktown's CXAM air search radar, approximately 46 miles out from her task force. She immediately suspended refueling operations 
and the planes which were in the landing circle were ordered to clear the ship. All appropriate damage control precautions were immediately undertaken. Yorktown's fighters were vectored out to meet the incoming threat, and they downed ten of the attackers in the ensuing fray. At 12.06, the eight Japanese that managed to get past the fighters arrived over Yorktown and began their attacks. At least seven of the eight were shot down, but not before they hit Yorktown three times. It was all over by 12.15, and Yorktown was smoking heavily and dead in the water. The first bomb blew a hole in the flight deck and killed or wounded a number of the men on the 1.1-inch gun mounts and machine guns at the aft end of the island. Planes were set on fire on the hangar deck, but the prompt release of the sprinkler system prevented a serious mishap from occurring, the type of which had doomed Lexington at Coral Sea. The second bomb did the most serious damage as it penetrated the uptakes and exploded. It was this hit which stopped Yorktown. The concussion extinguished the fires in all of the boilers except number one. It ruptured the uptake from three boilers in the forward fire room and completely disabled boilers two and three. The third bomb struck on the starboard side and penetrated to the fourth deck, where it exploded and started a fire. Excellent damage control and valiant acts by her crew got Yorktown back underway about an hour and a half later. About 30 minutes later, a second wave of torpedo planes and fighters was picked up on radar by the cruiser Pensacola. Once again, all appropriate damage control precautions were taken by Yorktown's crew, and her fighters were vectored out to meet the new threat. Several more were launched, just as the Japanese attack got underway. Several Japanese planes made it past the fighters and were met by a curtain of AA fire. Yorktown managed to avoid two torpedoes with skillful maneuvering, before her luck finally ran out, as far as torpedoes were concerned and she was struck amidships on her port side by two in very quick succession. Yorktown, listing heavily to port, lost speed, and was turning in a small circle to port due to a jammed rudder. She lost all power and went dead in the water as white smoke poured from her stacks. Without power, the list couldn't be righted, and there was thought the ship would capsize in a matter of minutes, so orders were given to abandon her. Her crew completed this in an orderly fashion, and were picked up by nearby ships. At about the same time Yorktown was being attacked by the torpedo planes, her scout planes found the last Japanese carrier. Enterprise then sent out a strike which included 14 Dauntlesses from Yorktown that had landed on Enterprise while she was under attack. This group put the fourth Japanese carrier, the Hiryu, out of commission with several direct bomb hits. Over the course of the next two days, Salvage efforts were made to save Yorktown and tow her back to Pearl Harbor. By the afternoon of the 6th, considerable progress had been made, and her 26-degree list to port had been reduced by 2 degrees. The destroyer Haman had tied up on her starboard side to power submersible pumps earlier in the day, and things were looking up for the injured flat top. She was proving to be as stubborn to sink as her sister would be in later actions. Then, at 13.35, torpedo wakes were sighted off her starboard side. Haman tried to get underway but was struck amidships, which broke her back and she sank in three to four minutes. Two torpedoes slammed into Yorktown's starboard side below her island, and her fate was sealed. She would linger on through that evening and night, until rolling over on her port side the next morning and slipping beneath the surface just after 7 a.m., her battle flag flying as she went to the bottom. In all, 141 officers and enlisted men lost their lives on her during the battle. Yorktown served her nation well in the short time she was afloat, helping first to stem the tide, then to turn the tide of the Pacific War. She was an innovative, durable design that shaped and guided U.S. carrier operations and naval aviation in the direction to supremacy of the seas. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button comment, and subscribe so that we can bring you more insightful content just like this.